There is no way out but through, and there is no one coming to save you but you. Dave, Johnny and I are so excited to have you here with us. We got to experience some fun in Las Vegas and Elite Human Dynamics, and now we welcome you to the show to share your latest book, Into the Darkness. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's I've come a long way since our time in Vegas at Elite Human Dynamics, but it's it's been a journey. It's definitely been a journey. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I was a Green Beret for a number of years, and then at one point I became an intelligence officer. And I did some pretty cool things uh, in my career, but I think most importantly, the things I'm passionate about is a lot of the stuff that you talk about here on Our Charm. It's emotional intelligence, emotional bids, feeling people out. Uh, and mostly my book, you know, it's got a pretty cool cover, but a lot of it is about emotions and it's about internal dialogues and, you know, the, the things that we face inside of us and, and how to deal with it. Yeah, and how that impacts our relationships, which was a big motivator for us to even start The Art of Charm. And we had a great opportunity to, to train with you in Las Vegas. And recognizing your journey and the identities that you've taken on over the years, from the special forces to the intelligence community, and now as a mental health advocate. I'm actually working with a client now who's uh, stationed overseas, and she just went dark on me. And... I'm like, I, I don't know if it's because you don't have connection or now you're on an operation or like you just don't know what's going on as to why you were talking and all of a sudden you're not talking anymore. <laughs> like, very sneaky. No, I know. And, that, and that's kind of how the life is too. You know, if you're doing sensitive things, like you you come down on something, you, you don't give people forewarning. You don't, right? You just dump your stuff and, you know, you pop up back on the net when you do. But there, there, I'm not you know, correlating that they could be doing something that, you know, you never know life, family, yeah. life events, stuff like that happens. Oh yeah. But I know that, uh, yeah, it is really tricky. I mean, you do have to live two very separate lives and in a more interconnected world that we live in, it, it gets very, very difficult. It's not like you just, Hey, I'm day fielding one day and then the next day I'm AJ. And then, you know, who's, who's, we're day fielding. He's not replying to my text. Where did he go? You know, so it's yeah. You know, th these are these are things that um, not so much me anymore, but the future generation has to has to contend with. <laughs> well, it's also it's fascinating because you're in a role that requires you to keep developing these people skills and emotional intelligence, but at the same time, you have to keep the people in your life at a far enough distance that you can be operational and drop everything to go abroad and do what you need to do. So you're balancing, like, I'm getting this training. I need to be developing these skills outside of training. But at the same time, I also need to keep everyone at arm's length so that I can be functional. And, and, and honestly, that was, you know, some of the things I talk about in the book, but like, you're absolutely right. It's, it's when, when you go out there and you start dating and you're, you're doing these jobs and you, you can't, you know, the other person knows what's up. Not knowing what you do, but they're just like, there's this wall and I can't peer over it and I'm afraid to ask. And then you being the emotionally intelligent, you know, intelligence officer, right? You're feeling that. And, you know, if you're an empath like me, it's like, oh, it, you know, it just like kills you on the inside, you know? Yeah. And, and that's- You hate that part of the job. Totally. That's why a lot of people just date within the community because it's just easier, you know? <laughs> yeah. Contextualizes all of your behavior. Exactly. It's like, uh, I remember I was, I was dating one girl and I was getting phone calls from work at like 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, you know, from someone on the other side of the world. Like, Hey man, like, Hey, I got some questions, you know, can you help me out? And, you know, and, and they're like, who is that? Who's that bitch? You know, <laughs> at, at, at midnight. No, and it was like, no, it's it's my friend in Iraq. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, it's like <laughs> it's actually a dude. It's a really important call. Yeah. I need you to leave the room. But <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's not a booty call. It's not what you think. No, not what you think. No, you know, you're my only one. You know, <laughs> like, and it, and it is kind of funny because, like, you know, when you put it when you put it on a table. There's something we, we say, you know, when someone mentions something, it's on the table, right? And so, you know, conversation wise, someone mentions it. So you can ask about it. And then when, when you put some of these things on the table, 
the whole thing is to alleviate the other person's concerns, right? You have to convey it in a way of being like, yeah, you know, I do this, right? And, or this is what I do. And, you know, there's not a whole lot I can really talk about that. And they're like, okay, cool. Right. And, and usually a, a person, a normal person is going to be okay with that, you know, or they're going to be like, oh, that's pretty cool. But it's not like you can take work home with you. <laughs> no. And this is a situation where your job requires you to withhold information, but the relationships in your life don't feel comfortable with withholding information. Absolutely. And it's like you, you definitely, back to what we were saying, it was like it's two different lives, definitely two different lives. Like, you know, it's, you go from one um, in the morning, you're, you're the intelligence officer out there doing a surveillance detection route. Going out there, meeting a source, getting the intel, running back, you know, all within a certain time frame window to keep on your appearances with everything else. And then the stress of that, you go home and you just got to pretend like nothing that day didn't happen, you know? Um, and a lot of it is you could just be like, I had a, babe, I had a stressful day at work, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Don't ask me anymore. <laughs> and this is something that AJ and I had the opportunity to really get to understand when we work with the military, uh, such as yourself, which is you're human beings and you have these, these tasks that other normal human beings aren't going to have to execute. And that makes you guys special, right? There's a special ability, special training, and, and, and a special mindset that has been adopted, learned, and trained in order to go out and, and accomplish those feats. But at the end of the day, when you're done, guess what? You're still a human being. Your mind is still thinking about things. Your emotions are still processing certain things. Your heart is healing from everything that it, is, it has been through because heart and mind soul and body, this is all interconnected. Absolutely. No. And, and just so for the audience, I did the uh, elite human dynamics course with AJ and Johnny um, when, during my time in the intelligence community. And I think it's real. you bring up excellent points and, th and that's exactly what I say in the book, you know, is that you zoom out to whatever 2D image you have of a, of a green beret or Navy SEAL or intelligence officer, right? And and we have all these Hollywood movies that we can look at and say, wow, that's really badass. But at the end of the day, all of us got the same problems we all have. And we all deal with things, you know, we all deal with things in the, in similar ways. You know, it affects us in similar ways. It, you know, it brings us down. You know, the 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 trial, I like to call it the seasoning of life, right? The seasoning of life is out there. And, you know, you go through these things and how do you deal with it? Part of being more emotionally intelligent, part of you know asking people their why is gain, gaining that perspective and in learning, yes. you know, deeply and connecting with somebody. Whereas you know we you know as Green Berets or or at least my time in the IC, it's like we're not just pawns on a chessboard. You know, we got we got children. Guys got married with family. You know, married with fa with families and and you know whole slew of things. Or they could be going through. You know, it could be taking care of a sick parent, for instance, you know, and it's like that when you're in your mid thirties, you're going through that you of life, man. Right. You know, um, ultimately what this training does, you know, especially what a lot of the great things that you guys do that I love is equips you with the, the bare bones of what you need to do to connect with people, to be more human. And I think the beautiful thing that you guys do, do with us is you open up that aperture, you know, because we see things one way, right? We're the product of our own environment. When you have experts out in the private sector like yourself with all the experience that you have and you're teaching and coaching us, is going to make us better leaders, right? And, and, and what I say in the book is, you know, if there's anything you're going to do and ask your people why, you know, take that, take that five seconds to ask that person why. I, I talk about this all the time, it's like, I, I, you know, when I was an intelligence officer, you see, everyone goes in, they get, they get the, they get all these great points, but no one ever asked the source why. Like I, I've worked with people, and I'm like, hey, what's the source's motivations? And they go, they love America, and I'm like, I have a feeling that you didn't 
ask enough. Ask why? Ask why <laughs> with that question, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> and, and I'm like, you know, so everybody goes through, you know, we all go through a lot of similar training. We all get, you know, similar stuff, but it's, you know, and granted, we all make mistakes and stuff, but that's, that's the most important, important arrow in your quiver to, to pull out and use, you know, and it, and it doesn't just not in the intelligence community, not in special forces, but in everyday life, everyday life, because humans are human, man, you know, and we're, we're messy and we're not perfect. And I, I, I you know, yeah, I, if anything, this book is, I, I tell the worst version of myself, like it's, and the, the reason why I tell the worst version of myself is, well, A, it's the truth and B, it's, you know, there's something me and um, AJ were talking about before you jumped on. It's um, there's a, a conversational ploy called give to get. And we were talking about when I came to elite human dynamics and how the first day we did the videotaping and, and basically what, what you had me do was, was bump somebody and videotape me. And I started talking to the, I started talking to this person and they didn't get a single fact. They didn't even get my name. They didn't get anything out of me. And, you know, the, the crowd that we had was a bunch of IC types. And we're all like, yeah, that's a true professional right there. And I, I look at the video. I was like, oh my God, I was a fucking cyborg. Like what, <laughs> what, what happened? And the beauty of the, the beauty of the job is what takes time and practices is understanding that everybody is an onion, right? And we all have multiple versions of ourselves. We all have, you know, today I'm this, you know, I, I'm feeling like I'm in this mood. The other day I'm in this mood and, and other people are like that too. So when you're showing up for somebody and you got to think, all right, so what version of myself do I need to be for this person right now? Right? Do they need to be, do they need to be motivated? Do I need to be more of a coach? Do I just need to listen? Do I just need to, you know, these are all things. This is ebb and flow. And I feel like there's, there's a lot of things out there that people are like, follow this five-step method and it'll work every time. No, not with people. You know, you can't, you can't put people in buckets. You can't, you know, you can't follow that, that, that one solution. It's, I kind of, the, the thing I've learned definitely from your training and my experience over the time is that every new person I meet is a blank canvas and I'm just filling it out with colors, you know, as I learn. And, and the way to do that is asking them why. <laughs> well, I'd love to talk through your journey and there's, there's multiple identities in this journey as we talked a little bit before Johnny hopped on, but you know, what drew you to the special forces then to make the leap to the intelligence community and then now as an advocate in the mental health space, you know, this is different parts of your identity that even Johnny and I have now witnessed from having worked with you originally to where you are now. So paint a little picture for our audience what the journey has been like for you. I was always destined to serve, I believe, ever since a young kid. My, my grandfather was um, in war, he was a pilot in the RAF during World War II. He was shot down and was a POW for 18 months in Stalag Luf III. And the night of the great escape, they were determining whether they were going to amputate his legs or not, right? And so he actually worked on the second set of tunnels after he got out of the infirmary and was in Stalag three for 18 months until he was liberated by the Russians. So I grew up with this story in my head. I'm like, you know, I was just waiting for my moment, but, um, I ended up, I went to college, I went to a military college. And then afterwards I had some friends in New York and they were like, Dave, the war is going to be over. Just come to New York and make some money. Right. And obviously they're all from Boston. So that hence a little bit of accent in there. But, and so I was like, all right, yeah, you're right. And I, you know, I worked in, I worked in Manhattan. I worked for an ad agency for about two years and I saw ground zero. And, you know, all of a sudden I, you know, I was reminded, I was like, what am I doing? I'm not a guy. I'm not a desk guy. What, what is this? And so <laughs> I, <laughs> I was watching all my buddies go off to, to war, fighting Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm like, I have to do, I have to do, I have to do this. And I, uh, I did an 18 x-ray contract, which for your audience is, uh, it's a special contract that the army does. It gives you a chance to try out for special forces. So I, you know, went in, went to basic training, infantry training, airborne, and then I went to selection and then I got selected. And then I did the special forces qualification course 
which is anywhere from 18 months to two years long, depending on your job. I was in uh, 1st Battalion, 1st Special Forces Group in Okinawa for five years. I look back at sort of my family, kind of like, you know, my grandfather was like a guy that always did hard things. And so I, I grew up doing hard things from an early age, just in honor of him. And, you know, my father taking me uh, hiking up in the White Mountains. I remember the first hike I ever did was uh, Mount Lafayette. And I did, uh, it was a nine mile hike. And I did it, in, I was nine years old. I did it in Tevas and there was a mist storm at the top of the mountain. And I had no idea at nine years old, we were in danger, but we were in a lot of danger. Right. And, and so, you know, it was, I almost got, he was like holding on to my little East pack backpack as I was getting blown around on the ridge. And, and so I always have, I had a lot of stories like that to like lean on and, and look back at. And then, you know, kind of towards the end of my time in Okinawa, I, I, I applied for this special program to become an intelligence officer. And, and the reason why I did that was I was gone pretty much like nine months out of every year in special forces. And so I decided to kind of being, being a, a spy or an intelligence officer was a lot more stable uh, lifestyle. Surprisingly. Like, surprisingly. <laughs> to give you any, you know, there's that crazy matrix. Yeah. Like I, I was just all up in this quadrant. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like for, for me, it would be bring me stateside in, in, in a decent area, which is Washington, D.C. So I, I decided to do that. And, um, and plus I was on deployments. You know, when you're on, the, on all these deployments, it's, it's a lot of boredom, you know? I mean, you're doing cool stuff, you know, as a Green Beret, but you do have a lot of downtime. And, you know, you don't have internet, you're just, you're in some open air barracks, right? Uh, you know, with sleeping on a metal, metal bed with a uh, mosquito netting and you got nothing but time on your hands. It, you know, you're just training, training the host nation forces and, and, and stuff like that. And so you're, <laughs> I read a lot of spy novels. So, you know, when the opportunity came, I was like, I think this is cool. And, and really for me, like we were talking about this earlier is that, I saw that as an opportunity for growth because part of me was more introverted. I saw myself more as a as an introvert, more as a thinker, uh, very analytical. And but there's definitely been versions of myself in my life that I've been very extroverted. And I was like, I like that guy. And I was like, I want that guy to come back. And I kind of saw that intelligence officer role as as a way to kind of do that and and sort of break me out of this. Um, Break me out of my shell, so to speak, and where I, you know what I was doing. And now moving into mental health advocacy, I think is a, a big takeaway from the book. And you know what has been that shift now? Because one thing that Johnny and I recognize with almost everyone we've worked with in the military is we get one version of them while they're active, and then we get this whole other side of the rainbow once they've retired, where we get to see quite a bit more of them. So how how are you viewing this part of your life now? It's to, to say it's great is a disservice because it's really awesome. I feel as though the person that I had to be, the person I had to be in the uniform, the person I had to be in the intelligence community, there is, it became exhausting, right? It was the emotional dissonance. And it wasn't like it was anything bad, but, you know, for me to be a good guy on a team, to be, you know, the good intelligence officer that I was is that, you know, there's, there's a game that you have to play. There's a game that you have to play in the, in the office and, you know, you have to be a certain way. Um, and I felt as though as, you know, I was falling, you know, it, was, it took more energy to be that person every single day. So when I made a decision to kind of get out of the military, you know, deciding to do the book. And so for, for all our listeners out there, it's I struggle with suicide. I struggle with suicide. And the book, the book is about um, – I'm basically breadcrumbing my mental thought process that led me into the darkness. And I think that the reason why I wrote the book was because I've lost so many friends to suicide over the years. I've lost more friends to suicide than I have to combat. And we've been at war for how long? Right. And so it's that, that is, a, it's a, we're up to 22 veterans a day now. When I wrote the book, it was, on average 17. Yeah, the numbers are disheartening. It is. And and but here's the thing, it's that it's it's a, it's I think it's the second or third leading cause of death amongst veterans my age. But when you look at the United States as a whole, it it's the 11th 
the 11th leading cause of death, creeping up there. You know, cardiovascular disease for, it has been number one for a long time. And we have cancer and just go down the list, right? Diabetes, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of comorbidities with, with these things. But so I figured I had to tell my story. I had to tell my story because I wanted people to read this book who are, you know, who are out there struggling to see, oh, wow, I'm heading on the same path that he is, right? And, and really to the same internal dialogues, the same conversations that, you know, the most important thing, the most important conversation that you have is the one with yourself. You know, I, I was at the moment of truth, you know, so to speak, and, and how I got out of the darkness as well was using the same mental toolkit that I learned in all my intelligence training and the same thing that we talk about at Elite Human Dynamics. I was intrigued by the angle that you wrote the book because obviously it's it's about some relationships you had while you're out, while you're on these missions and how they were af affecting you. And when I hear that, hey, I'm, I'm a military guy. I wrote a book about my service. I'm, of course, my first thoughts are, it's, oh, it's going to be tanks and guns and explosions. And sure, there's some of that here, but this is more about what you were going through uh, going on these missions and 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 having to deal with a, a a normal life and normal relationships, even with somebody who works in the military. So was this was it difficult to write that book in that way, or did you find it liberating for yourself to write that book in that manner, or a little bit of both? I found it difficult in the fact that when I had to sit down and write this thing. I had to become that person again, the person that's in chapter one, the person in chapter two, the person in chapter three, and going through that mental thought process of what I was doing at that time and, and, that, and that recall and, the, and the, 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 all the ugly internal dialogues I was having with myself. Because you know, chapter two is you know, it's, it's a great chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters uh, that I wrote because it's they're during my time going through all the intelligence training. But it it, it was also, I was dealing with some serious stuff. Like I was going through a divorce. I, you know, was questioning, you know, why, like, am I doing this to myself or why is this happening to me? I just, you know, all these things that you, all these things that we all go through, you know, the whole time I was, I was there, I was just saying, I can't win. I can't win. That's probably the most dangerous statement that I was making to myself was that, I was saying, I just can't win. And I was looking at this as like kind of this uh, zero, you know, this, this game that, you know, if I felt like I did it this way or if I did it that way, then, then I would win and I'd feel better about it. But that was the hard part of was trying to encapsulate a lot of those, re-encapsulate re a lot of those emotions because when I step into that person, that it kind of sticks with me for a couple of days, right? And I was just like, and there, there's like an ick. There's definitely an ick. I remember when I did the elite human dynamics training, I was in the throes of chapter one and I was in the throes of like, what is this book going to be? And I knew it was going to be an ugly book because I wanted to talk about suicide. I wanted to talk about the, the ugly stuff. And, and so that, that was the hard part. The second part to your question, right, is I, th I wanted to write a book that hasn't been written like this. You know, maybe there's, there's, there's comparable comps, but I don't think that there's many people, many people in the military community are not known for being vulnerable, you know, or, or that showing, showing emotions and, 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 you know, it, it, talking about, the, you know, the worst days in such a way. And I feel as though I wanted to kind of change, I want to change, you know, people's thinking around it because we, we, we think of opening up to people as weakness. Or, you know, you know, talking to other, talking to others, be like, Hey, you know, I, you know, I'm not, I didn't have a great weekend, you know, and that's an opportunity to ask that person why. And, and a lot of, a, a lot of, a lot of people are like, ick, you know, that's ick. I don't want to know, you know, like don't, you know, cause of their vibes and everything else. But really that person's telling you that, like I say, is that they're putting it on the table because they need you, you know? And so what I, what I'm trying to portray is that, there's a lot of courage and there's a lot of strength in what I like to call in the book is called owning your shit. And, you know, own it, owning that, owning your weakness, owning your vulnerabilities. For me, owning all those internally dialogues and asking myself why, you know, why did I end up in this way is to show that there, there is resiliency 
And there is a lot of strength and power in this. And that you can, you know, for me, I'm a, I look back at that person and I, I laugh now, right? <laughs> and oh, the folly of my ways. But I got through it. There was days where I didn't think I was going to make it through. And I completely understand that. I think for many, when they think of darkness it, in your background, it's in the theater of war. But what's so fascinating to me is all the darkness was actually back home and what you had hidden from the people that you cared about most back home. And when you explain your experience in the special forces, especially becoming elite, that requires you to present yourself in a way where there is no weakness, where you are the strongest person in the room, the most alpha, and all of your achievements are being measured constantly in that environment. Absolutely. Then you move into intelligence, and information is power. And sharing the wrong information, it's a career. Like there is a hierarchy of moving up and you have some, some members in the intelligence community who are holding information against you back home, not in the theater of war, not what's going on on the mission at all. So that is, again, training you to, to turn inward, to hold on to all of this darkness, to bottle it, to channel it into your actions against the enemy, to channel it into the theater of war where the darkness is celebrated and can be used in a manner to move the country forward. But ultimately, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> It's, it's there inside of you. And the chapter in the book, you're reaching for the gun, recognizing like, I want to end my own life. Even though what you are achieving is being celebrated back home, bagging top terrorists and completing the mission that the president signed off on, where everything that, that had drove you on this journey was to reach those heights in your career, was to be elite in the military, then to be involved in missions that were taking down our top enemies from presidential orders. And yet here you are sitting in all this darkness and turmoil because you had hid so much of yourself from the people you cared about. And the emotion and the rawness and the realness that comes through on those pages is so poignant. And I, it frustrates me, as I was saying earlier, that so much of the version that Johnny and I get from the active duty military, when we're trying to break through and showcase the power of the vulnerability and the power that lies in connection, is to hide that version of yourself, to not share that version of yourself. And then we talk to people who've left the military and they'll share with us, AJ, Johnny, this elite human dynamics training actually brought me closer to my wife. It brought me closer to my best friend who's just civilian, who had nothing to do with any basic training or military. It allowed me to actually feel like my true self. So much of my training and so much of my experience was about running from that person, hiding that person, being at arm's length with that person. All excellent points, AJ. Like I, when you one thing that you just said that I, I have to jump on is running from yourself. Running from myself was oh, I'm just going to go out and do something awesome again, right? And if you look at like small examples of this in the book, right after the relationship, the the that sweet, beautiful, toxic relationship that I was in, <laughs> that spicy one that you know the one that almost kills us, everybody, you know that one. When that ends, I am taking it out on everything around me, right? And I remember there was an ISIS target that met, met Trigger. So it was a, a bad ISIS terrorist guy. And uh, we had information on it on where he was at. And so I, you know, I'm like, hey, baby, Christmas Day raid. It was only a couple of days before Christmas, but the pitch was to the leadership, like Christmas Day raid, you know? And, and, and people, people are like, what are you crazy? I'm like, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> but that was like, that was, a, that was me running from myself in the moment, right. To try to just replace that void with some sort of success. So when I got, when I caught off the, I mean, it's a, not a bad a combat zone is not a bad place to be going through these things sometimes, but fast forward, I get off the plane from there. We're in the throes of COVID. I have, I don't have that anymore. And, and I was, and I literally sat there, I said to myself, I said, you know what, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do another ultra marathon. We're not gonna try to, you're not gonna do a master's degree or what everybody else is doing to keep busy. I literally said to myself, I'm like, we're gonna sit here as, as painful as this is gonna be. And we're just gonna, we're gonna work through whatever this is. We're gonna work through this, whatever this is. And, and, and I knew I was running for myself in some way, shape or form. And at that moment, it, it was actually okay. COVID gave me the chance to just stop. And as, as hard as it was every day 
by myself, like not being able to see family, not being able to do any of that other stuff. It, it's like looking internally and sitting there and, and, and peeling that onion. Where did it all go wrong? How did I turn into this person? Why am I, why am I this way now? You know? And it, like I say, it's like I wide myself to death to like face my ugly truth. It was, it was the lesson that you mentioned early in the book about reframing, right? And in order to reframe your situation, you must first take responsibility for that situation. So radical acceptance. This is the situation. This is everything that is bad with it. This is everything that's good with it. And I'm going to accept it. Now, I'm going to fix this in my mind so that I'm going to get something out of this situation, that I'm going to find something to enjoy in this situation, where I'm going to be the smiling Sisyphus pushing this rock up this hill. And though everyone thinks it's a curse, to me, it's the ultimate challenge, right? And we can't reframe those things in our mind unless we have the radical acceptance. And yeah, sometimes it is accepting absolute dog shit. Right? Accepting COVID is going on, everything's a crap, and I'm just going to sit here and I'm and I'm just going to soak all of this in and accept it. Absolutely. That's 100 percent it. And and that was the hardest thing I had hardest pill I had to swallow. Because you know, it's you you read the book and it's like, oh man, he just keeps making bad mistake after bad mistake. Now <laughs> <laughs> and there was many times that during the reading of that book, I was like, Dave, just stop. <laughs> hey, man, I did, I did it all for love, man. No. <laughs> but like, <laughs> we've, we've all been there, man. Yeah, yeah. I totally get it. But it, it, it's, it was that acceptance. And that's what I say is like ultimately, you know, that radical acceptance, you know, to, to the point is what I say is like owning, owning your shit, you know, and, and getting to that point of – just there is no way out but through, and there's no one coming to save you but you. I think a a challenge that I see in, in reading the book and, and recognizing in your experience is that there's this duality with the military where that darkness can be harnessed to accomplish the mission, to do feats of heroism, put yourself in danger, kill yourself in the line of duty to protect others. But when that darkness is channeled in suicidal ways back home, it's something we don't want to talk about. It's not heroic at all. And in fact, it's a scar on the military. And this darkness that's going on inside of you that's building up is it's a combination of training. It's a combination of mission. It's a combination of the relationships and the strain that it's putting on your relationships. And also this lack of true identity in yourself, running from a divorce, jumping into the, the next relationship with someone who's not healthy for you, and then throwing yourself overseas into this mission, recognizing that, well, how can I channel this darkness instead of recognize and talk about the darkness with others so that everyone can see, hey, we're all carrying this, and how do we deal with it in a more healthy manner? In the military, you know, you have behavioral health resources, but the, the thing in these elite communities, whether you're, you know, Special Forces, Navy SEAL, or, uh, you know, Ranger Regiment, you know, the, the myriad of, of units that are out there doing awesome things. It's you raise your hand and you say, Hey, I'm having a problem. Well, you know, part of the identity in, in a lot of us, you know, we train our whole lives to be in that position. Right. And so you're going to, you're going to bench me. You're going to take me off of operations. And, and then, and for a lot of those guys, in, in one of the cases that I, I talk about in the book, it was a, a friend, you know, more of an acquaintance, I would say. But I saw, I saw this this guy Jake. He wrote, he rose his hand and said, "Yeah, hey, I, I really need to be taken off operations. I need to focus on my mental health." He was dead two months later, or a month, a month and a half later, I think, not even. And and I, for me, I was like, "Oh, I can't do that," you know, when when I saw that example. And, and so I knew I had to work through it myself. I think it's part of what we began this conversation with is like being human, being a better human. I think with all my crazy stuff going on, if I just had like a leader that like pulled me in and like heard me and understood me instead of, you know, cause like in the book I was talking about, I was like, you know, I probably should have gone on this deployment cause I'm going through a divorce and you know, it's, it's kind of a lot of stress on me and I'm going to lose a lot of money if I have to settle this and go on this deployment. And they were like, oh, it's not a big deal. 
I'm like, not a, not a big deal guys. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I, I just, I, I don't look at it that way, but at the same time, me being who I am is I'm not going to say no to a deployment. You know, it's a lawful order. You tell me to deploy. All right. Hell yeah. Mission first. Like I'm going to go, you know, but if I, if that person just took the time, you know, and took a time out and actually like sat there, asked me why related with me. And then, you know, if had some sort of had a real vulnerable conversation with me, I think I would have been fine. I think I would have never ended up in the, in the state that I was in. Um, I mean, ultimately it's, it was on me that I ended up in that, in, in that position, but it's so important that in these instances in leadership positions that we look for those little tiny cries for help. We look for those little tiny cries for help, especially amongst the strong. You won't know that they're hurting inside, you know? And, and, and a lot of the suicides that we see, it's like, everyone's like, I didn't know. I had no idea. I thought he was doing great. And that's what, those are the ones that hurt the most, you know? Um, and so, cause we look internally and we say, oh, I wish I reached out or I wish I called. I wish I picked up the phone. I wish I checked in. You know, for me, like now every month I, I check in with a myriad of friends. You know, I just send out random text messages like, hey, bro, how you doing? You know, that's it. You know, just, you know, and, and I look for those conversational cues, right? Those, as we say, the conversational gates. I look for those little cries for help. I look, you know, in, in, Amer in America, we, we kind of say, yeah, I'm doing good. Usually that's not, it's either I'm doing great and then you're like, that person's okay, but I'm doing good. Okay. There's something going on there. Right. And you know, there's all these tiny conversational cues in our, in our culture that we can dig into. And that, that's a, that, that person's putting it on the table, man, ask about it. You know, like, well, Hey, what's even if it, if, even if they really do mean good, it's like, Oh, well, that's awesome. What's good. What's, what's going on. That's good. What do you got going on? Right. And then, you know, you, leads to more conversation, et cetera. So it's, it's just being human and having emotional intelligence and, and learning these, these little things that, that you learn with Art of Charm, Elite Human Dynamics, X Factor Accelerator. Well, I think, you know, one of the challenges that, that we've seen is it's a high trust group of individuals, right? To, to be successful in the mission. And that trust is built around strength. And what you're talking about is identifying and admitting that you're not as strong as you appear and others need you to be. And that's not going to happen at the group level. And leadership has to recognize that and understand that, hey, we got to pick up on these tiny cues and then we got to pull them aside and, and we got to do it in a way that it doesn't impact the trust within the group and it doesn't lead him to lose honor in this group because that loss of honor potentially triggers the suicide. And in a lot of ways, what we're talking about here is, is dealing with tough emotions that you're just not taught to deal with personally or in a group environment like that. You're taught to bottle, to run from, to ignore until the darkness is too much. And that's exactly what happened to me. And you think that if we are just there for each other a little bit more, right? You know, shedding all this stuff, right? I got my green beret right behind me uh, next to my head. You know, taking that hat off, right? Be Dave. Don't be Sergeant First Class Dave or Master Sergeant So and So. You know, be yourself. I, I remember uh, uh, when I when I published this book, I sent it out to my network and my former team sergeant. So a team sergeant in Special Forces, he's the leader of the Special Forces team. He's the end, the non commissioned officer in charge. Uh, what he says goes. Now you have an officer on the team; they're part of the leadership, but the the master sergeant the team sergeant's responsible for wrangling all us animals and keeping us in line but he opened up to me about you know he read the book and he opened up to me about his journey and everything and i had no idea that was going on in the background too and i just think of how much better that team room would have been if we had those tough conversations with each other you know at the team level and then even it, not even just within special forces, but in any other military unit, even in the intelligence community, you know, people work in teams, people work in these small, these small bits, you know, we get so wrapped up in the day to day and what we have going on in front of us. We forget about the importance of that human connection and that human dynamic, right? So, so much stuff is happening on Slack or email or zoom, 
and granted, like, you know, everyone hates commuting and I see where the, where the world's going. That's okay. But you know, that, that human connection, taking that time to, to, to develop, like you can really turn the course in, in, in how someone's day is going, you know, and some people need more help than others. Right. Yeah. And that's part of the friendship. You know, that's part of, you know, developing genuine connection with people. And taking the time to consider that you're more than just the mission, you're more than just the outcome. Like there's a human behind it who has struggles going on, no matter how important that mission is, whether it's in the military or in the business world. You know, we all have goals, KPIs, things we want to achieve with our business. But at the same time, like recognizing that team members might be struggling with a, a sick partner or family member or going through a tough time in their relationship and battling divorce or depression and recognizing that, hey, you know, someone's acting out of sorts. Someone's being a little short in their communication now. That's not normal. Recognizing these small signals, these emotional bids as we, we teach in Elite Human Dynamics to recognize that they need extra support. They need us to, to reach deeper and to connect outside of the mission, the goals, the outcomes that we all want. Because and when you do that, you're, you're, you're literally building loyalty with that person. That person will do anything for you, you know? And, and having those connections and that, that genuineness is just so important. You know, it's a concrete, concrete of the relationship, all relationships. I think of uh, the people that I jive with the most. It's just like you say, if you step back and you videotape it, you look at how many emotional bids are being met in that conversation. It, it's it's up here, right? It's all the way in the sky, you know, versus someone you just met, you know, not not as much. But like, that's that that's really it, you know. When someone's opening up to you or asking you. You know, make sure you reciprocate. Yeah, it's such a powerful understanding that many people feel underappreciated in their role. It doesn't matter what everyone else is saying to them. It doesn't matter the impact that you see that they're driving. The words of appreciation, letting that person know how integral they are to not only the team, but much larger outcomes, gives meaning to the work that they're doing in the role that they're in. And as a leader, it's important for you to recognize that it is your job to give that meaning to people that you're working with. You can't assume they're finding the meaning on their own. You can't assume that they feel appreciated. And recognizing in a lot of these hierarchical organizations, only feedback that's really given is negative and is held on to. Yeah. The preponderance of evidence that they have is negative. And if you can come in with a positive effect and you can share the impact that they have on you and allow them to find meaning in their work, well, you unlock performance, you create a high trust environment, and you foster the relationships that end up creating the win for everybody. Yes. We seem to be so hesitant to be positive, right? We almost feel like, I, I don't know, a lot of organizations tend to hold on to these things, you know, and not really parade around the victories, you know, celebrate the wins of under, others. Right. And, and I think of like my experience of going through all, a lot of the training. Uh, I say this in the book is that the whole time I'm t I, I told that I was being told I sucked, you know, <laughs> and, and, and you start to believe it after a while. Right. And, yeah. and, and that, that's bad psychology, you know, that's bad psychology. If we're going to create people that are going to be confident to be going, to be going, to be going out and doing these jobs and doing tough things, we have to, we have to believe in them, you know. If we, a lot of people need people to believe in them, so they can believe in themselves because they don't see it themselves because they're stuck, you know, with those those negative experiences, right? And and granted, we fail, we fail. Everybody fails. Like, and I'm I'm big on getting to failure fast. Is kind of was one of my <laughs> well, yeah. Fail great. As Johnny had shared, you know, one of the reasons we've enjoyed working with the military so much is that you chase failure in a training environment because it lessens the likelihood of failure actually on the mission. Whereas many of our clients come in trying to impress us or avoiding failure even in their training and their fear of failure keeps them from the growth that the training is meant to provide. Whereas in our work with the military, especially the elite, it's chasing that failure in that controlled environment, on that video mission that you shared, chasing that failure in that room, understanding you're going to get skewered, you're going to get red, you're going to get yellow, very few green, but recognizing that that failure in that environment is so far more important to you 
being successful in the mission? Yeah, because the mission's too important to fail. And I think that it's having grown up in that environment and just in realizing that failure is the best teacher, you know, a hundred times over. And just, you, but that's the thing. It's like, you just get, get right back up, put your boots on and get, and, you know, keep working, keep grinding and, and, you know, move on. Uh, that's what makes organiz That's what makes us good at what we do, you know, is, is we're put in no win situations. A lot of the time, um, there's definitely been scenarios I was in. I was like, I'm, I'm not winning in this one. So I'm just going to. We're going to have to take this one on the chin, you know, um, but yeah, but being tempered like that over many, many years, when you go actually go out and do the job, you're ready for that worst case scenario. And wrapping here, you know, what is your lesson to our audience who, who might be feeling those thoughts of despair and darkness right now? I definitely, what I want you to do is ask yourself why. Well, first off, have compassion for yourself. I think that was the biggest problem I had is I never had compassion for myself. And that's why I was always running from myself. I was like, oh, well, I just got to be tough. And, you know, I got to do tough, you know, I got to go out there and do tough things. Right. And it's like, no, have compassion for yourself. You know, tell yourself, you know, it's okay to feel the way you feel because that's human. Right. And, and really it's, you know, the, the, your experiences, it's okay. But what I want you to do after that, once you give yourself a big hug and a self do and a good old self-prescribed dose of self-love, is I want to I want you to ask yourself why. I want to I want you to ask yourself why did you end up in this position? Why did you end up with these feelings? What was it about the situation that led you here? How did you let that? You know how did how did it become this? And I, and how did you get to that point? And then. You know, when you, when you have that truth, what are you going to do about it in the future? And then this, oh, for a lot of people, you know, you might need some extra help with this. And so, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is a thing. That's a great thing. Help work with somebody else. Having a friend, you know, calling a friend. I, 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 I think that, you know, being vulnerable with other people helps us bring the answers to us. But obviously, the right person too. Um, so that's my advice. If you're, you're out there struggling and there's, there's a slew and if you're, there's a slew of resources out there, 988, if you're in a mental health crisis, call that immediately. Um, and then tons of resources out there online. I know that, uh, better help. It's like right there in your pocket. If you need cognitive, you know, there's all these different therapy options that you could do there. Um, so there's people out there that want to help you, you know, and um, you can get through it on your own. But, you know, if you really want to grow, you got to have you got to have this ugly conversation with yourself. Well, thank you for stopping by. It's been a joy for Johnny and I to, to not only train you, but then see the journey thereafter. Yeah. Thank you, AJ. And uh, thank you so much, Johnny. It's been a real pleasure to be on with you guys. And um, it's been a hell of a journey. <laughs> Where can our audience find more about the book? Uh, definitely. Uh, my book is titled uh, Into the Darkness, A Journey of Love, War, and Emotional Freedom. My name is Dave Fielding. You can search it on Amazon. It, it, it will audiobook will be available shortly. I know it will be on Audible and a lot of other streaming services as well. Um, you can check me out at DaveFielding.com or um, uh, DaveFielding.dol on Instagram and DaveFieldingDOL uh, on X. Awesome. Thank you again for stopping by. Thank you. Mm -hmm.